on September the 11th through the 14th, 1978. We present the Warren Matson debate on the existence of God. The propositions for this debate are as follows. The first proposition reads, I know that God, that is, the God in the New Testament, who is to punish some individuals eternally in hell, does not exist. Dr. Wallace I. Matson is in the affirmative and Dr. Thomas B. Warren is in the negative of this proposition. The second proposition reads, I know that God, that is, the God of the New Testament, who is to punish some individuals eternally in hell, does exist. Dr. Thomas B. Warren is in the affirmative, and Dr. Wallace I. Matson is in the negative of this proposition. This production was directed and videotaped by Dr. Rex A. Turner, Jr., and by Dr. Curtis A. Cates, administrators and professors of the Alabama Christian School of Religion, Montgomery, Alabama. This film has been copyrighted and reproduced by the National Christian Press, Incorporated. Any reproductions, use, or sale of this film without written permission from the authorized representative of the National Christian Press is strictly prohibited. Matson, ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to be back with you for the second speech of the evening to reply to what you've just listened to and to continue my argumentation. What I have to say in the beginning of the introductory remark is certainly relevant to my entire case uh, because Dr. Matson has made a great deal, as he continued to make a great deal, of the alleged contradiction between the existence of God and the existence of evil. This is why I want to keep before you the fact of what I had already accomplished along this line because it is relevant to what we will be doing tonight as it's clear from what he has said already. He started off by saying that my task is impossible because my proposition is self-contradictory. And this he alleges because it is simply impossible for there to be an infinite good God and evil to exist. This is nothing but his assertion. He has not taken up my case, the basic affirmation which I made on the charts which I presented. He did not take up those charts. He said that the first part of my speech had nothing whatever to do with what his responsibility was to reply to, but it was there that that problem was answered. In the positive element, I showed 22 propositions which cover the entire problem of the existence of God and the existence of evil, and that there is no contradiction between the existence of the infinite good God, who incidentally is the God of this proposition, Dr. Matson. That's the God we're discussing. The God of the New Testament is the infinite good God. And I have explained in that positive element, and in the negative element, and in the counter element, how that occurs. In the counter element, I show that Dr. Matson's case involves him 
in an admission of self-defeat. However much he tries to escape it, he cannot escape subjectivism so long as he alleges atheism, and that is not an undistributed middle. As an atheist, he has no ground whatever for saying that one thing is better than another, save on a purely subjective basis. And he gave concrete proof of it by getting up here and saying that so far as he's concerned, fornication is not wrong unless it does harm to someone. But there are many other people who say that fornication or adultery or homosexuality or group marriage or trial marriage or whatever are all wrong. Now, Dr. Matson, who decides who is right? Just your say-so? Just your subjective feeling? Or is there such a thing as real right and real wrong in regard to the relationship between the sexes? Is it wrong for two men to live together, for two women to live together in sexual intercourse? It that men such as Dr. Matson have really taken charge of the educational system of this country, and there is even now underfoot, underway, a plan to teach our children that every person makes his own decision. It's called value teaching, and you had better be investigating to see what's happening in your own public schools as well as your own colleges and universities. It is this kind of man who is now in control, basically, of the educational system of this country. My proposition is not self-contradictory. He has not dealt with the material that I've given, and a wave of the hand will not take care of it. Now, his illustration about the aircraft engineer knowing what would happen, oh, that's a terribly hard argument. It's based allegedly to show that if God knew what was going to happen, God is evil if he created the world. Of course, God knew that man would sin. The Bible teaches that even at the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ was a lamb slain. It was a part of the eternal plan of God to save man by the gift of his son. Of course, God knew man would sin. But friends, let us notice, and I did not read the Bible simply a moment ago to say, look, the Bible says it, therefore it's true. Now, Dr. Matson, if you'd like to have another debate in which we discuss whether or not the Bible is the word of God, I'm sure that can be arranged. But that was a misrepresentation. That was not the way I used it. I said, no wonder the psalmist said it. I'm saying the same thing. The psalmist saw the marvel of his body and cried out in adoration of the existence of God. I see the marvel of my own body and of yours, and I do the same thing. Now let's notice in Isaiah 45 and verse uh, 9. I'm not just quoting this because it's so, but I'm showing you the basic fact. You can argue about it philosophically. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker, let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashionest, What makest thou? Are thy work that he hath no hands? Woe unto him that saith unto his father, Why begettest thou? Or to the woman, What hast thou brought forth? This is simply the case, as is argued well in the book of Job, and it's certainly philosophically sound, that granting from a counterfactual hypothesis for Dr. Matson, if man envisions the possibility of there being an infinite being, would he be wrong to create, knowing that man or would fall into sin, and to even call him to account for his sin. This is making clear that there is no platform from which we can stand to make that judgment. And God goes into great length in the book of Job to make that clear, and it is true. There is tremendous presumption in the mind of this man to think that he can so judge an infinite creator, infinite in knowledge and wisdom, infinite in power, infinite in goodness, infinite in justice, to decide whether or not he should create. And so his illustration about the aircraft engineer amounts to exactly nothing. And his point about fornication simply verifies what I've said all the way through of this. To be an atheist, you must, in effect, deny free will because you're nothing but matter in motion. Everything is nothing but a physical reaction to a physical stimuli. It's any better than another, or that one thing is right or another thing is wrong. Now, he says Dr. Warren's task is impossible because the proposition is not self-contradictory. went into that again, and I have shown already that it is not. He then says he would like to discuss the, the, the flu debate, the propositions in the flu debate. Well, Dr. Matson, that's the action of the God we're discussing. The infinite God of the Bible is the good God of that proposition. 
Now let's notice my chart 4i and the terrible misrepresentation which he made of it. Dr. Matson, let me suggest to you kindly that you listen a little more carefully to what I said. In proposition number one, this is talking about the origin of human beings. Either human beings owe their origin to creation or to evolution. I'm not talking about the evidence or the existence of the world as a whole. That's another problem. We could talk about it, but that isn't what this chart says. I am confining this argument to the existence of human beings. I gave him another chart that showed that plainly. I am arguing from man. The world was on that chart, but I showed that I'm arguing from man. Let's look at 96A just briefly before I back up there. Notice the world. It is man. That's from which I am making my argument. Now back to 4I. Now the argument in the premise in number one is creation or by evolution. That exhausts the possibility. The truth of the matter is, if you have a disjunction and that disjunction is true, and you deny one of the disjuncts, then the other must be true. Here we have a case of strong disjunction. It does, it does set forth the only possibilities. Now, Dr. Matson admits, he's even reiterated it here tonight, claiming the eternality of matter, though, of course, he couldn't prove it if his life depended on it. That there was at one time no life. In his book, he said, there is no such thing as spontaneous generation. Yet tonight, he now states his case on generation of life from non-life. Now then, if at one time nothing existed that was alive, all that is alive is not, all that is here is non-living matter. But there comes a point in time at which there is life. Now, Dr. Madsen, I ask you to address yourself to that problem. Now you not only have that problem, but you have life changing on up to human life. There had to come, Dr. Matson, a split second in time at which there was something that existed that was living, given your theory, that was not human, but in the next instant, it was human. Now you'll have to explain how that happened. There is absolutely no way he can get around that. And what I have said in this first proposition still holds. Creation or evolution. Did man evolve? Did there go from non-living matter to life? And then by changing complexity on up to something very complex life, but was not human. And then the transition from human, from non-human to human. He has already admitted that nothing non-human ever was transformed into human. Nothing that was human ever was born of something non-human. Those I submit to you are the only possibilities. Therefore, evolution is impossible. Now, I submit again that creation or evolution are the only possibilities for the ultimate origin of human beings. Notice how he so deftly, perhaps I could even say deviously, but I refrain from doing so, uh, avoided the fact that I said the origin, the ultimate origin of human beings. Now then, human beings if they do exist, by is the origin of man, for creation can come only by God. If evolution, then it must have been either by birth or by transformation. It was not by birth or transformation. Therefore, evolution is false. Therefore, creation is true. That argument stands, and Dr. Matson has not touched it. Now, back to the point of my... Uh, affirmative. How much time do I have, Brother Deaver? I want you to look at chart number 96D. In chart number 96D, we have a man with his nose and mouth taped up. How long can he live with his nose and mouth taped? About five to six minutes at most. Da brain damage occurring probably even before that. Now let's look at 96D1. The human respiratory system proves God does I'm talking about the God of my proposition, the God who is good, the God who is infinite, the God who is self-existent, the God who does not depend upon anything else for his existence, the man who is the creator of man, the one to whom all of us owe our ultimate origin. Notice the human respiratory system, 
According to Dr. Matson, it owes its ultimate origin to non-living matter. I say it owes its existence ultimately to God. Now to the chart on 96E, where I was as I stopped last time. You will notice that Matson mentioned to death, he gave a wave of the hand and away he went. The circulatory and respiratory systems prove God. Now, friends, we're dealing here with the fact of a five-minute time frame for human life to live. Here is something that does not have a human respiratory system. Now, can it evolve, given Dr. Matson's theory? Absolutely not. The only way it could have come into being is by the mighty creative power of an infinite being who is self-existent. Dr. Matson has admitted in his book, The Existence of God, that the present, that the evidence available indicates that for all he knows, the creation out of nothing is possible. This constitutes proof that that is so. As we think about the marvel of the human heart, the marvel of the lungs and relationship to one another, the complexity of it, we're not talking about mere probability, we're talking about uh, absolute impossibility. Notice chart number 96F. Notice the marvelous interchange in the oxide in the blood. Without this amazing interchange, no human being could live more than a few moments. And thus, the systems required to accomplish inter this interchange could not have evolved from non-living matter or even from some living thing which did not have such systems. Thus, since being an atheist claiming to know that God does not exist is utter folly. The atheistic proposition is clearly false and theism is true. Let's look at 96F3, more detail of the argument. If the gaseous interchanges, that is, of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the respiratory system of a human being possess such properties or involve such things as to make clear that such interchanges were not brought into being by any part of or the totality of dead matter, then the respiratory system of the human being in which these interchanges occur must have been brought into being by the creator who transcends the universe God. The gaseous interchange in the respiratory system of human beings do possess such properties as to make clear that such interchanges were not brought into being by any part of or the totality of non-living or dead matter. The rest, therefore, the respiratory system of the human being must have been brought into being by the creator who transcends the universe, that is God. Let us look at 96.4F, the explanation of the interchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the human respiratory system. First, we note that the tension of oxygen is lower in the venous blood than it is in the alveolar air, but the venous blood has a higher tension of carbon dioxide. The pulmonary capillaries in the air and the alveoli are separated by membranes. Notice this interchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide is not like tying one hose of water up to another so it just goes down that way, but it has to go through a wall, as I showed you on a previous chart. The pulmonary capillaries in the air and the alveoli are separated by membranes which are so delicate as to be freely permeable to these gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide. How could that possibly have evolved? There is simply not the time frame for it to have occurred. It is absolutely impossible. It requires the infinite power, the infinite wisdom, the infinite knowledge and the goodness of Almighty God. The differences in the relevant pressures of the two, that is, <clears throat> of the um, passages in which there air and carbon dioxide are favorable to a rapid inward diffusion of oxygen from alveolar air to blood and an outward diffusion of carbon dioxide from the blood to alveolar air. Now notice the 96G. Now I'm anticipating that Dr. Matson will take care of all of this with a wave of the hand and nothing of it is relevant and he's got something that shows that the proposition is self-contradictory, even though I have given charts in great detail showing that his alleged charge is simply false to the very core. Now let's look at the alveoli of the respiratory system. I challenge him, I plead with him to take up this information and explain it. Life from non-life, human life from non-human life, the human respiratory system from that which had no respiratory system. Dr. Matson, I challenge you with every ounce of my being to take up this argument and deal with it point by point as you have the responsibility to do. Notice, let's look at the alveoli. They are grape-like bunches of very small air sacs. 
Each person, we are told, has approximately 750 million of these. All of them together likely have a surface area which is about 25 times that of the skin. Spread out flat, they would probably cover as much as 600 square feet. Compare a room of 30 by 20 feet. Each alveolus is covered with a network of capillaries. These capillaries are so small that red blood cells must pass through them one cell at a time. Isn't it marvelous that we have the blind, non-proposive, non-intelligent, non-living matter to bring this about? That's what Dr. Matson is asking you to believe. He's asking you to believe that matter is eternal and that out of this, without a single thing that was intelligent, without a single thing that was living, without a single thing to bring this about, all of this has come about simply by sheer chance, by mere accident, without any planning, whatever. Through the very thin walls of the capillary, the blood gives up its waste, carbon dioxide, and takes on refreshing, life-giving oxygen. Without this interchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen, no human being could live more than a few moments. The body's entire blood supply must pass through these small blood vessels every few minutes. The blood goes in one end a dark blue, black, and out the other a bright cherry red. Day and night, this process must go on without interruption. You go to sleep at night, the two pumps in your heart keep on going. And if they should stop, you wouldn't wake up the next morning. They'd find you dead in bed. If it stopped for longer than five minutes, you'd be dead. The entire body must pass day and night. It is clear from these facts that man did not evolve by mere chance from non-living matter but that man was created from God, by God. From some, some final points here. In order for the atheist to know that God does not exist, he must first know that the human respiratory system owes its origin ultimately to non-living matter, but he doesn't know it and he cannot know it. Therefore, he does not know that God does not exist, but we know that he does because this is the only explanation that fits the facts. All right, now let us notice a uh, proof that, a that theism is true and atheism is false on chart 96H. No, 96H1. If the respiratory system, what the mean on this chart, Pro premise number one, if the respiratory system of human being actually does exist, then the actually existing respiratory system of a human being owes its ultimate origin to the intelligent, propulsive, creative act of the infinite being of God, or else owes it to evolution. Now, friends, when you have a disjunctive proposition, if that disjunctive proposition is true, and you deny one of those propositions, then the other one is true. If A or B, B is false, therefore A. And certainly if you have strong disjunction, as we have, as I've already showed you in a previous discussion. Now, the respiratory system of a human being actually does exist. It therefore follows that it is either by creation or evolution. It is not by evolution. It is impossible that the human respiratory system owes its ultimate origin to atheistic evolution. Therefore, by disjunctive syllogism from five, we find, or from three and four, we find that creation does follow. In chart, uh, premise number six, obvious since there can be no creation without God. Therefore, theism is true from proposition six and five by what we call modus ponens. It's simply an affirmation of the antecedent. If theism is true, then atheism is false. And therefore, since theism is true, then atheism is false. Now, friends, I have shown by the existence of man and the marvel of his body that God does exist. There can be simply no doubt about it. How much time do I have now, Brother Deaver? All right, then I won't get into the next point. been asked to make a couple of announcements that are of significance regarding the debate. In the publication of the debate, there will be the questions that each participant is 
exchanging, printed in the debate. There will also be all of the charts. If you've missed the charts and have not seen these by way of illustration, they will be also in the debate book. So you might want to keep that in mind as you're making up your mind about purchasing the debate in printed form. Ray Mooney, speaker for the National Weekly Radio Program presented by Druid Hills Church of Christ in Atlanta, Georgia, entitled Insight, that's the name of the program, will interview Dr. Warren and Dr. Matson for the Insight program. Insight is carried over some 156 radio stations, and the program will be a two-part or possibly three-part series. And we would encourage you, if you're interested in this, and obviously you will be by, because you're here, to consult your local listing in order to hear these interviews following the debate. Possible two or three part series. And this interview will be made Friday after the debate has uh, come to a, conclu a conclusion, but it will be some summary points. I'm sure that these participants will be making and observing about the debate. Now I turn the floor to Dr. Mass. Thank you. Well, I would say a real horse, not an invisible one. Dr. Warren has stated that the alveolar system is wonderful. I agree. Of course, from that, nothing follows as to its history. Dr. Warren stated that it's impossible that it owes its origin to evolution. Well, we shall see. The only reason he gave for that, that I heard, was that there, we don't have the time frame. I don't know just what he means by that, but uh, Five billion years are a long time, and a lot can happen. Dr. Warren made a number of other points in his last presentation. Perhaps there'll be time later tonight to get around to all of them. Right now, though, I think I'll just deal with his complaint that I have paid no attention to his ape mother of a human child argument. Well, I hope to remove the basis for that complaint. <clears throat> to do so, I shall have to start discussing evolution. Now, I confess that I feel a number of uneasinesses in finding myself in the position of being called upon to defend organic evolution as an account of the development of life on Earth and particularly of man. Oh yes, Dr. Warren complained of me that I talked about the origin of the or creation of the universe and he was only talking about man. I stand corrected, though it doesn't seem to me a point of great importance. What one has to say about one will largely apply to the other as well. Well, in talking about evolution at first, in the first place, I have the eerie sensation of being in a time machine. There's a sense of being back in Dayton, Tennessee in 1926, wasn't it? At the Scopes Monkey Trial with William Jennings Bryan and Clarence Darrow and H.L. Mencken. I had thought that these matters were settled, at least when one was dealing with university professors who are members not only of the American Philosophical Association and the Southwestern Philosophical Association uh, Society, but also of the Philosophy of Science Association. I'm not advancing this as an argument, Dr. Warren. I'm only describing my feeling and my erroneous belief. The second uneasiness is the feeling of perhaps being about to get out beyond my depth. I do claim some professional competence in the subjects we have been discussing on the two previous nights, and indeed on what I brought up 
in my first presentation tonight, which was mostly logical points. But I am no kind of biologist or paleontologist or comparative anatomist or geneticist or anthropologist. My education in none of these fields has gone beyond the reading of popular expositions. And I share the reluctance generally felt by members of the learned professions at going outside my field. In this case, not just outside my specialty, whatever that is, or even just philosophy, but outside the humanities altogether and into the exact sciences, where I feel a stranger and as butting in. I feel this uneasiness, especially if I'm to have to do this in such a public place, with my every word and gesture being preserved for eternity on audio tape and videotape and by two court reporters. Where's the other one? <laughs> I guess they spell each other one at a time. I'll do the best I can. Uh, and when I look at the slides that are brought against me, I am in a way cheered up. I was aware that in his debate with flu, Dr. Warren gave no indication of any familiarity with even basic popular accounts of evolution. But I thought that of course he would have profited from his encounter with flu to the extent of familiarizing himself with the topic at the very least by reading a book or two or auditing biology one at Vanderbilt. I guess they teach evolution there, don't they? I mean, all the colleges are degenerating as we've just been told. So I was afraid that I would be embarrassed by being pressed to engage in technical discussions concerning immunological distances, mutation rates, comparative anatomy of the teeth, prokaryotes and eukaryotes, theories of the composition of the primitive atmosphere, and Lord knows what else. When I, as a matter of fact, haven't even memorized the succession of the geologic periods. But, unless he's preparing an ambush for me, this hasn't happened. Here comes the same argument, the monkey mother of the human baby that was thrown at poor flu so many times and reduced him to gibbering almost. This argument, a reductio ad absurdum, namely, if evolution is true, then at least one non-human being must have been the mother of a human baby, but that's absurd. Therefore, evolution is false. See, I didn't think. Well, that is the argument I'm going to discuss at the moment with considerable preliminaries. I say I am cheered up in a way when I see this argument hauled out because it's rather easy to deal with. But at the same time, and I think more intensely than I am cheered up, I am appalled at it as flu was. Flu is too tactful to say it, but I'm, as you know, not a tactful person. I am appalled that I have been brought all this way to be confronted with something so awful. Flu gently and tactfully tried to point out to Dr. Warren that evolution is not a matter of jumps, or not one year there isn't an alveolar system or one second and then another second there is, but rather of extremely gradual transitions through intermediate forms that share in varying degrees and different respects the characteristics of the forms at both ends. But try as he could, he could not get this across to Dr. Warren. Well, I'll make one attempt. If it doesn't work, I'll repeat it. If that doesn't do it, I might wait one more try. But after that, I'll give up. I won't stick it out to 70 times 70 or whatever the biblical number is. There's not time for one thing. 
All right, now let's consider the following argument, which isn't the argument I just gave, but another one. Some people say that the Spanish language evolved from the Latin language. But if it did, then there must have been at least one Latin-speaking mother whose baby was Spanish-speaking. But that's absurd. How could they have communicated? So Spanish has nothing to do with Latin. And I suppose, well, that's the argument. I'll repeat it. If Spanish descended from Latin, then there must have been at least one Latin-speaking mother who had a Spanish-speaking baby. But that's ridiculous. So Spanish didn't evolve from Latin. This argument, I think you'll all agree, is not only a reductio ad absurdum, but is itself as absurd as anything can be. You're all aware, I trust, that Spanish is a linguistic descendant of Latin. Of that, there is no doubt possible. And I think all of you, including Dr. Warren, can easily comprehend how Spanish could, and indeed did, evolve from Latin without any such embarrassing situation as contemplated in this joke argument, which, noted well, is exactly parallel to Dr. Warren's blunderbuss to shoot down evolution. They stand or fall together. If organic evolution has to be false on account of the mother-baby difficulty, so necessarily must be false also the known history of the Romance languages, and for precisely the same reason. In considering why this linguistic fundamentalism won't do, we might pick up a few philosophical morals. How can we get from Latin to Spanish without running into this impasse in the nursery? Very easily, of course. I doubt whether before I mentioned it just now, I doubt that anyone ever even dreamed of such a difficulty. People in Spain who spoke Latin just spoke more and more slangy, slurred, in quotes, ungrammatical Latin, and as time went on, these modifications becoming, being cumulative, they came out with a language quite different from Latin. No trouble at all. You can, in fact, hear that kind of process going on right here and now, for that matter. You and I both speak English, but my speech is quite distinct from yours in all sorts of ways. After I say three words, you can tell I'm no Southerner. And if Florida were cut off from the rest of the states for several generations, as Spain effectively was from Italy, the inhabitants of Berkeley and Tampa, when at last they met again, would probably not be able to understand each other. They'd be speaking by that time Berkeley and then Tampese. The philosophical moral I want to draw from this is that there is no such thing in the world as the Latin language, some monolithic, fixed, changeless entity existing on its own. Or at least there wasn't when Latin was a living language, which is what we're concerned with. All that existed out there, objectively, to use Dr. Warren's favorite word, in the world, was millions of human beings in the Roman Empire talking to each other and being understood. In order for them to be understood by sort of whoever might come up and listen to them, their vocables and speech patterns had to have a certain similarity, but never identity, not between any two individuals at all. Every Roman had his own speech habits, characteristic intonation, favored vocabulary, none exactly like anybody else's. There were not these individual speakers and also the Latin language any more than there are you individuals out there and also, over and above that and beside it, tonight's audience. Tonight's audience is just a convenient expression for referring to you 
individuals all at once in this particular relationship. It's a great convenience to have words like tonight's audience, because if we didn't have them, I couldn't talk about you all without reciting the list of your individual names. So before I got one sentence out, you would all have gone home. Well, it's no different with the Latin language. It may frighten some people to tell them that the Latin language never existed, but I hope you can see now that there is a sense in which that is true and useful, furthermore, a useful thing to say to someone who has fallen into confusion from thinking that there is some individual thing with its own essence called the Latin language and that every sentence must either be in Latin or not in Latin so that the question, is he speaking Latin, always has to have a yes or no answer. Now, Latin and Spanish, as well as the more familiar word, at least in philosophical examples, bald, B-A-L-D, are examples of what are technically called fuzzy concepts. Although in most, case, in most cases we can state unequivocally whether or not something or other is to be subsumed under them, whether it's true to call a sentence Spanish or Latin or a man bald or not, there is, in each of these cases, a borderline area. So you're confronted with the question, where are you going to draw the line? Now, an important point, it's the rule rather than the exception for a concept to be fuzzy. There are exceptions like triangle and infinite, perhaps infinite, good, all-knowing being. But those are exceptions. Things like horse or Spanish or man are fuzzy concepts. It's sometimes thought, as by Dr. Warren, that fuzziness can be removed by precise definition. But this is an illusion, at least when we're dealing with anything very complex actually existing in the world. One might suppose we could define bald as having fewer than 100 hairs on the head, and then it would be only a matter of counting. If he had 100, he'd not be bald, and if he had 99, he would be. So then, in principle, when we have this precise concept, we could always tell whether a man was bald or not. But if we tried to do that, we'd run into trouble, even in such a simple case, because we come upon problems like this. Does this teensy bit of fuzz here count as a hair or not? And what about this undoubted hair that's placed so near the midpoint of the ear? Does that go with the head, in which case we count it, or does it go with the beard, and so we don't count it? And as you can easily see, with languages, the project becomes altogether impossible. There is no even conceivable way of defining Latin and Spanish so that there is even in principle always a yes or no answer to the question, is this sentence Latin or is it Spanish? Well, I'll make one qualification on that. We could, in principle, by Gerdelian methods, never mind what they are, we could write out all the possible sentences, say 500 words long or less, all the possible sentences in all possible languages, and then arbitrarily tick them off as Spanish or non-Spanish. But what would be the point of doing that? It would be a perfectly arbitrary procedure, and our catalog would, I suspect, engulf the world, at least if we tried to do it. Let's look at a few more features of linguistic evolution. Tell me, how much more time do I have? Two minutes. Two minutes. Uh, I think I can get through a little bit of this. There is, of course, a whole science of linguistic evolution, though I don't think it has stirred up the emotions of organic evolution. One thing to notice 
is that the unit of linguistic evolution, that is, the entity that does the evolving, is not the individual speaker's speech, which tends to remain pretty constant through his lifetime, but the speech of the whole population of intercommunicating people. Excuse me, I've almost forgot something, which I'll use my remaining time to do. It happens that this month, providentially we might say, the Scientific American has a special issue devoted entirely to evolution. Now, Dr. Warren was so very kind as to send me a copy of his book Against Atheism when it was published, and I'm very happy to be able to uh, return the kindness by presenting him tonight with this, if he will indeed take a look at it tonight and tomorrow just a little bit, I think our discussion might be very much improved. Would you pass it down, please? Thank you.